Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, as all of our Mispakar are coming into the stream. All right, Toda Rabbah. Mori Kanan, appreciate that. All right, we we have a very uh, interesting lesson. The text you you've heard before, but as I was going through, thought I was going one way, then the father had me go a whole different way. So it's going to be a different approach. So definitely want everyone that's in the in the stream to pay close attention because. This will clue you in to things and help you in your journey. Because sometimes in our journey, we focus on things that really in the long run won't matter. And we really have to focus in on the thing that's going to help us to make it in. So we say Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom to all of our Mispakah that are logging on to the stream. We appreciate your presence. We welcome you once again to the live stream of My Living Branch. Today we're going to be talking about the oil report. And we're going to go over a very familiar text. So um, you probably read the text a million times. So hopefully today will be able to help you to glean some points from the text that you may not have considered or you will be enlightened to say, man, okay, that makes sense. I, I can I can use that. So we really appreciate all those that are logging on. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll get started. But just as a way of announcements, uh, from today forward, even going into the new year, our service times will be every other week. Every other week. So we have in service today. Next week, you'll be able you'll study, do the things that pertain to Shabbat, enjoy the Shabbat. Then we'll come back the following week and have another lesson. That's going to be our new format. So I want you to get that in place and you'll be able to see it um, on the website and also uh, on live stream. And as I told you before, as things move forward, the father's going to begin to change some things. And you will be wondering, okay, what's going on? But if you're in tune, you'll know exactly what's going on. So let's pray, Miss Baca. Appreciate all our wonderful mores being on there, uh, on here today. Uh, we got Mori by Yahoo, Mori. Um, Yes, Sharon, Maury Kana, appreciate the mores. Mad props to you all for lessons and living. All right, let's move forward. Baruch Hashem Yahuwah Elohim Malik HaAlam. Father, we say Toda Rabbah for all your goodness. We thank you for your very presence. Father, as we navigate towards this new year, I pray that you give us insight. I pray that you would give us the things necessary because this year, this year will be a pivotal year for many that are taking heed to your voice and that are listening and in tune to what you're doing. I pray, Father, that you bring renewal in us. I pray, Father, that you make our way straight make the crooked places straight 
and all the places of doubt and insecurity filled with faith in us as we move forward, believing and watching you to make ways for us. We say, Toda Rabbah, for all that you do, we bless you today. In the name of Mashiach, Yahusha, Halel to Yahuwah, Amen. All right, so we're talking about the oil report today. Now, we're going to read this. I'm going to read through it, then we're going to go back. And I'm going to give you some points that you might not have really pondered on in the, in the, in the uh, parable. Okay, it's from Matthew, Matthew, Yahoo, 25th chapter, first verse. And we've read this, um, team, we've done lessons on this before. But today is going to be a little different because we're, we're focusing in on some specific areas for you to consider. Then the rain of the heavens shall be compared to ten virgins or maidens in some translations who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five foolish. Those who were foolish, having taken their lamps, took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their containers with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom took time or delayed or tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. See, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those maidens of the virgins rose up, trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us of your oil. Because our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, no, indeed, there would not be enough for us and you. Instead, go to those who sell, buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who who were ready, went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. And later the other maidens or virgins also came saying, Master, Master, O Sovereign, Sovereign, open up for us. But he answering said, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, Because you do not know the day nor the hour in which the son of Adam is coming. Okay, so, I mean, we've we've read through this many times. So now I I want you to notice that they were all grouped together. And he describes this as the rain of the heavens. And he and he compared it in a parable to this story. That there were 10, but even in the 10, there were five wise, five foolish. So even though there could be a group that's going in the same direction, within a group, there can be those that are going to be wise and those that are going to be foolish. Okay, and, that, and that's, you get that every place, you know, you, you, you see that sometimes in the workplace, you see that among families, you, you, I mean, just, you, you got those that are going to be wise and those that are foolish. Now, as the story goes on, the ten, the ten divided, five wise, five foolish, we start looking at the character (laughs) because one of the things that's going to distinguish wise from foolish 
It's going to be the decisions and actions of the individuals. Okay? The choices you make. So look at look at what it says. Those who were foolish having taken their lamps took no oil with them. Okay, now remember they all in a group. So they saw the wise not only take their lamps, but they saw them take the oil too. But the wise took oil in their containers with their lamps. Okay, and in the ESV, I, I like how it reads in the third verse. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flax of oil with their lamps. So the oil becomes a pivotal point in this whole story. Because you have the wise that has a container with oil, but the foolish took no container, so therefore had no oil to supply to their lamp to make it burn or to keep it burning. Because if you remember in the story, it says their lamp, they said that their lamps were going out. So they already had some oil in their lamp. But they had not planned or taken action or made a decision to bring that which could refill their lamp to keep it continually burning. So as you can see, we emphasize it again. One, some of the things that's going to separate the wise from the foolish it's going to be decisions that are made. And sometimes decisions are made in the face of knowing what the right decision to make is. Because you can see others making the right decision. But whatever it is inside causes you to make you think that you're going to be okay. I'll, I'm, I'm going to just do it this way because I don't want to carry that extra weight around with me. You know, it, it's, it's just a, a burden for me to have to do all of that. So the oil becomes a pivotal part. Now, what was the challenge in this whole story? <laughs> the challenge becomes time. Now, I'm going to read it here because if the bridegroom had came right away, they would have been OK. But the challenge becomes time. Because the bridegroom delayed. Or took time. Now, notice what it says. Now, while the bridegroom. Some translations will say tarry. Some will say delay. The ESV says took time. They all slumbered and slept. Now, I want you to notice that in a lot of the parables that were given by the Mashiach, time became a factor. Okay, look at Matthew 24, 48. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed, it's the same Greek word right there. Look at Luke 12, verse 45. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. So this delay. This factor of time becomes crucial because what you will realize that over time 
if if a person hasn't really put their roots into the foundation of Torah and really endeavored to change their character so that their character matches Torah instead of trying to match Torah up with their character, they will over time revert back to what they used to be. So delays, taking time, tarrying, all that stuff brings out character. It shows the decision making of people, whether for the good or whether for the bad. Time becomes a crucial factor. And for us, time is very crucial. Some people might spend their time, you know, because, you know, sometimes, you, you know, people are factor, wow, I don't think he's coming back anytime soon. I haven't seen any signs, but we don't know the day nor the hour. So they get slack in their doings. They get slack in their character. They get slack with their building and striving and trying to move forward and being more like him. Okay? They, they still burning that initial oil that they had. Not realizing that that oil has to be replenished. There's a season of replenishment. We're going to get into that in a second. The whole lesson of time is, and you can get it from Mark 13, 13. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Enduring, enduring decisions, enduring character, patience, love, all this stuff. It makes no difference. You can love up to the last minute, then fall off. You have to endure to the end. Cross the finish line. Whether death comes first or whether the Mashiach comes back first. Whichever one, you have to endure to the end. Time becomes a crucial factor. <laughs> because when things delay, when doors don't open, when you think they should open, then do you continue pressing? Do you continue believing? Or do you just go to a whole different character? Okay, now I want you to notice that they all had common ground. The virgins or the maidens. When they arose, when the cry was made that the bridegroom is coming, they all had common ground when they rose up. And all those maidens rose up, trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us your oil. Because our lamps are going out. So they had oil initially in that vessel. But the oil over time burns out. But they didn't think to take responsibility and bring some oil like the five wise. Now, this is going to be some wisdom for those that will hear it. Notice what happens here. Okay. They all rose up. They all trimmed their lamps. This is also where the common ground ends. Many will do the common things. But who will do the set apart things? The set apart things are modeled 
for you in Torah. You have examples of what, how you approach things and how even, even when it came to the temple and the light in the temple, they had a responsibility. So though we have things in common, there comes a point where the common grounds end because of how people think and the mentality. And you've got to realize because what people look for when they didn't take ownership and responsibility to do the right thing, as in this story, they look for a bailout. Give me some of yours so that I can have oil in my lamp too. But you got to hear what the wise said. Okay? Because it's easy, you know, we, sometimes we have this, you know, we, we just want to share. and But sometimes people make decisions that they need to walk out. Okay? Because if, if they don't walk those decisions out that they made, just like these foolish, everybody suffers. And that's what people don't get. There comes a point where you have to give them instruction. No, you, you need to do this. I, I can't give you this because if I do, then I won't have any. But I won't have enough to last. Okay, now I want to show you some of the set apart. And I want to take you back a little bit. Exodus 27, 20. And you, you are to command the children of Israel to bring you clear or pure oil of pressed olives for the light. So this, this parable has a very significant meaning because the children of Israel were supposed to bring to the temple clear, pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually in the tent of appointment outside the veil that is before the witness. Aharon and his sons are to tend it from evening until morning before Yahuwah, a law forever to their generations from the children of Israel. Then you see it again in uh, Leviticus. 24 two command the children of Israel that they bring to you clear or pure oil of pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn continually. So remember what became the factor oil pressed oil that was used. Now, keep in mind that you are supposed to now be the temple where he, his spirit resides. And there should be a season where you go through a process of harvesting and pressing these olives so that your light can continually shine. The lamp. But what happens? Most people don't want to put in the work required for this fresh oil. Just like the foolish, 
They want to borrow it from those that have. They don't want to spend the time in prayer. Spend the time seeking. They don't want to spend the time studying, reading. They want everything handed on a silver platter. They don't want to go through anything. They don't want to experience no hardships. Remember that oil is what? We're going to find that it's, it's, it's a couple of things that happen. The oil, is, you're going to see that it's crushed and it's also pressed. And these things will provide a continual light. Now, now I, hope, I hope you see where I'm going with this. So, I found this video that, that I thought was very interesting. And, of course, I found it on YouTube, so I had to put the fair use and all that stuff. But I want to just play. It's very short, but I, I want to play some of it for you. I want you to listen. Hello, my name is Majd and I'm one of the guides at Nazareth Village. We are standing in our fully functioning replica of a first century olive press. We are entering the rainy season at the moment, uh, November and December, and this is the olive season, so our villagers already started harvesting. So, did you, did you hear what he said? Now, I want you to notice that the olive season falls outside of all of our quote unquote celebrated feast days that that we see in Leviticus 23. And, and I will turn it up. Okay. So thank you for that. What we'll do, we'll see if we can go back a little bit. I'm gonna play that one more time. Hello, my name is Majd and I'm one of the guides at Nazareth Village. We are standing in our fully functioning replica of a first century olive press. We are entering the rainy season at the moment, uh, November and December, and this is the olive season, so our villagers already started harvesting the olives off of the trees and we bring them in here in order to press them. Okay, so as I was saying, notice that the olive season falls outside of all of the other feast days now this is in israel this is why this is one of the better videos i found is he said it's during the rainy season which is november and december so this all the other feast days you're we're celebrating you know the harvest and bringing in but notice when this harvest is brought in. It's brought in during the rainy season. It's cold. It's damp. I think that's a lesson for us. Because the light has to be supplied with oil. And in order for that oil to be useful, it's got to come in this season. It's harvested during this season, these olives. It's outside of the normal seasons. So this is going to be, this oil, this press, this crushing, it's going to be a time when you are like, man, what in the world? I, 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 why am I going through? Maybe you're in your olive season. And you have to make the most of this season so that during the season you can produce the oil that's needed to supply that light. Didn't he say, let your light so shine before the world? Well, this is the season for it. So let's keep let's keep listening. Uh, of course, olives are hard. You cannot just press them right away. Uh, the first thing you do in the process is crushing them. 
Okay, did you hear what he said? The first thing that you do for the olives, because they're hard, is you have to crush them. Now, I want you to take note of what, he's, what he says about the crushing. Let's see, where were we? See the donkey okay. in order to press them. Entering the rainy season at the moment, uh, November and December, and this is the olive season, so our villagers already started harvesting the olives off of the trees, and we bring them in here in order to press them. Uh, of course, olives are hard. You cannot just press them right away. Uh, the first thing you do in the process is crushing them. And that's why we use this big stone over here. Uh, Mozi the donkey is helping us move the stone around, and this stone will crush the olives and the pits. Everything needs to be crushed so finely until it turns into paste. And then. Okay, this is a clue for us. This is another clue. During olive season, after they've harvested, everything has to be crushed. Did you hear me? The pits, everything must be crushed. And that's just the beginning of the process. So I want you to look back at your life. Some of the worst times in your life produced the best results for you because of the crushing, what you went through. But what happens today, nobody wants to go through anything. Everybody just wants to, boom, I'm there. I flew in on my helicopter. Nobody wants to go through anything. Nobody wants to experience anything. Okay, let's keep going. It's ready for the next uh, stage of pressing. The crushed olives then are placed in baskets like the one you see over here. We're hanging it on the wall. But of course you lay it flat and then there are pockets to the sides where you put the crushed olives preparation for uh, the, the actual pressing process. And then you take about 10, 15 baskets to press them together at the press. Now the baskets are brought over here and stacked on top of each other. Underneath them, there's a hole in the ground that is about two feet deep and it gets also a bit wider as it goes in. So as you press the baskets over here, oil is gonna gather underneath. The bivouac sits on top of the baskets, applying its weight as pressure. And then the three weights, the stone weights, are lifted using pulleys and leverage uh, in order to apply more pressure on top of the baskets. Each group of baskets gets pressed three times. The first time you apply pressure, you get the best quality oil. And according to the Jewish law, the first of your fruits you offer to God. So the oil from the first pressing, they will not use at home. They will take it to the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, now... Let's, let's make some note, okay? The, there was a crushing process, then there's a pressing process. Know how many times that, they, that he referenced? Three times they are pressed. And each time is more weight applied for the press to make the, the oil come out of what was crushed. So those, this is very, very, very interesting because it's in, a, it's in a season that's cold and it's in a, it, the process is grueling. You have to crush, you have to press, there's weights and man. So next time you're going through something, I want you to think about this process. I want you to compare what you go through with the seasons that the olives come in, with the process that olives go through in order to produce this oil. Because why does it seem like the people that go through uh, a lot, and I'm not talking about murmuring and complaining, resisting, fighting, all that stuff. I'm talking about those that go through it with humility and trying to, you know, find the father's hand in it and see him through the whole process. 
come out with a, with a brighter light. In that first batch, you'll find he talks about was the first fruit went to the temple. Then he's going to talk about the second pressing because they do another pressing. That's going to go towards food and so forth. Then they do a third pressing, which is uh, not not as pure. That goes towards soap and oil lamps. But notice that the first pressing went towards the temple. And the light, the perpetual light on the menorah that stays lit. Okay. The second time they applied pressure, they got good quality oil and it was used for food, medicine, perfume and cosmetics. By the time they got to the third pressing though, the quality of the oil was really bad uh, and they would use it for oil lamps and making soap. The olive press has a very strong connection with Gethsemane. The word Gethsemane comes from two Hebrew words, Gat Shmanim. And okay, so we're going to stop right there. But I, I thought that video was excellent. Um, when I upload the video, I will include this statement. And if you want to go and reference the video, you'll be able to click the link and go there. Now, I want to bring up another point. There's a curse. Side two, when you're disobedient. That will cause you to have no oil. Deuteronomy 28 40. You have olive trees in all your borders, but do not anoint with oil, for your olives drop off. Then in Micah 6 15, you shall sow but not reap. You shall tread olives, but not anoint yourself with oil. You should tread grapes but not drink wine. All of this is because of disobedience. Because we're going to see here what, at the, toward the end, what Mashiach told the five foolish. Now keep in mind, olives are small fruits that grow on Olive trees. November, December is the harvesting season. So you supposed to remember what it says? Bring forth your fruit in its season. And what will the fruit tell you? Well, look here. Matthew 7, 15. But beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are savage wolves. But their fruit, by their fruit you shall know them. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every good tree yields good fruit. And a rotten tree yields wicked fruit. Okay? Sometimes we got to be honest. The fruits that people produce points that they are a rotten tree. Then on the other hand, the fruits that others produce shows that they are a good tree. Because a good tree does not yield bad fruit. A good tree is unable to yield wicked fruit and a rotten tree to yield good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then by their fruits, you shall know them. So if you see olives dropping off of a tree. Out of season, before the season comes, that, that should tell you something. It's because that was a part of the curse that we read. 
Okay, now let's look. Wise versus foolish. Verse eight. And the foolish said to the wise, give us your oil because our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, no, indeed, there would not be enough for us and you. Instead, go to those who sell and buy for yourself. So what did the wise what distinguished the wise? Accountability and action. The foolish wanted someone to cover for them. They wanted to take the shortcut. They didn't want to take real ownership. It had to be pointed out. No, uh-uh. I, I can't. I can't give you my. Now, I didn't I didn't make this parable. This is this is Mashiach's parable. And I tell people all the time. Sometimes we race in to try to help when we don't know the underlying cause of why something happened. What was the underlying cause of why the foolish they could have brought oil but they didn't. Their actions. Their mindset. So when, when people display those type characteristics of the foolish and you are bailing them out trying to give them of yours, what's going to happen, you're going to perish with them. Because notice what the wise said, no, indeed, there would not be enough for us and you. Instead, go to those who sell and buy for yourself. Make them accountable. They chose the action. Accountability. Okay, now let's keep on with the accountability because it gets even deeper. And while they went to buy, the, bride, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him. See, they made themselves accountable. They know what they needed to be able to endure till he comes. And when he came, they were able to go in to the wedding feast. And then the door was shut. Verse 11, and later other maidens also came saying, Master, Master, open up for us. The other virgins or maidens came. The other five say, open up to us. They went, they bought the oil, but it was too late. But he answered and said, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Now, that right there is a very interesting phrase. I do not know you. What makes him not know you? When you walk in disobedience, he can't identify with that. The father identifies with righteousness. He identifies with his word. Anything that's operating outside of that spectrum, he doesn't have any identity with that. There's no darkness in him. He's righteous, loving, compassionate, forgiving. So he tells them, I do not know you. Now, if the, the wise had have loaned in their lamps, their oil were depleted, 
they would have fell in the same category. Watch therefore, because you do not know the day nor the hour in which the son of Adam is coming. So I'll, I'll go back and tell you again. Time brings out character. The father is unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's no shadow of turning in him. He does not change. Shahua, he changes not, according to Malachi. And he wants us to develop his character and then remain steadfast in that character until he comes. But because of time and delay and things don't go your way, it's so, it, it, it can slowly erode what you thought you built. And now your character is right back to where you started. It's time, it's time to get in olive season. It's time for a new harvest. It's time for you to submit to the crushing and the pressing so that new oil can come forth. And rekindle the light of the lamp that you should have. Remember, his word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. We've got to get that light going again. That light that's supposed to sit on the hill where men can see your good works and esteem the Father, which... Is in Shamaim of heaven. We've got to get that oil back to where it should be pure, to where that lamp is burning at full strength. Now, this lesson, I, I, this lesson is to provoke you to righteousness. If the lesson somehow offends you, then you might want to check your character. Because I don't give lessons to offend anybody. I give lessons to challenge your character. And sometimes lessons prick my head. Oh, be like, oh, okay, okay, I found that, that one's for me. I humble myself. And make the adjustments. But I, don't, I, I definitely don't try to get stout hearted. Or, or think that you know if one of the mores give a lesson that is being malicious towards anything. Because that's not what any more that's after the father's heart is trying to do. He's trying. We're all are trying to provoke people to righteousness. But what happens when things aren't where they should be and that word pricks you instead of humbling and saying, okay, yeah, I, I, that's, that's, that one was for me. So I get people all the time. People, sometimes I don't even, you know, know will email me saying, Maury, that lesson was for me. I don't know them from anybody. I don't watch them observe their life. But they'll email and say, Maury, that, that lesson was for me. It jump-started me to a, a, a new way of thinking, a new way of approaching things. And they'll have the right perspective because they're trying to do and improve themselves to be more like the Father. But if you go in the opposite direction, then it's really time to do a character check. 
Okay, and, and that's for all of us. Because we all should be striving to do what's righteous and to have our light shine. Okay? I knew it. Oh, it's time to pray. And y'all have been such a wonderful audience. Y'all talk too much. So let's go ahead and pray. I'm praying that the Father renews us because we're going into Pesach, and we want to go into Pesach in the new year with the right character. Father, I pray for your people. I'm asking you, Father, to cause them to understand the season that they're in. And when the olive season comes upon them, and it's cold and things are crushing and pressing. Let them see that that very season will produce oil that will burn and kindle that lamp and cause it to burn brighter and brighter. Father, let us not miss any lesson. I thank you for your forgiveness. Forgive us of our sins, our iniquities, our transgressions. Father, we are but dust, striving. Have mercy upon us. Show your love and kindness. We bless you now. In the name of Mashiach, Yahusha. Touch everyone under the sound of my voice. Father, and even for all of our mores, be that strength that stands up in them to give a lesson of encouragement, a lesson of direction, a lesson of that will cause people to rekindle themselves in you. I thank you now. In the name of Mashiach, Yahusha, Halel to Yahuwah, Amin. All right, and Ms. Bakai, if you want to join the Bookmarker Witnessing Team, just go to our website, www.bm.hebrewfoundation.org. You can also check out our bookstore. We got some good stuff there for. If you're coming in or uh, even if you're seasoned, Dead Sea Scrolls, all kind of good stuff. Okay, I've been saying this and now we are closer than ever. Passover is right around the corner. Pesach is here. So if you want to get training and teaching materials for your uh, children, this is for, this is it. The Hebrew Passover story, the Hebrew Ten Commandments. You know, get it, use it, participate with your children. They will, trust me, you know, if you interact with them and ask them to explain and ask them what they see, you know, it will be a tremendous blessing. All right, for your support, hey, our number one desire is your prayers. Send your prayers up, you know, that, hey, we'll continue to do the Father's mission. And if you would like to support us online, you can do so. The donation button's in the stream. You can also do Cash App, PayPal. You know, whatever the Father puts on your heart. If he, if, if he directs you that way. But hey, but most of all, we desire your prayers. I want to thank, say Toda Rabbah to all of our listening audience for joining us. And remember, we are doing, uh, we're starting Every other week. So there will not be service next week. But there will be service the week after that. And you will see it posted on the website. Or when you come to the live stream, it will have the acting counter. Okay. We're changing seasons. Things are shifting. And you got to make sure that you're in the right place right time or else you'll be doing like the five foolish asking to borrow and then the wise will have to say no you need to go buy for yourself so now is the time to get the wisdom together accountability and action you got this I know you can do it the father wouldn't give you a message if he didn't have the confidence in you to do it 
So be encouraged, Ms. Bakar. Enjoy the rest of the Shabbat. And remember, as I always say, let's make this the best Shabbat, sh the best Shabbat ever. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom, Ms. Bakar. This is Maureen Medad Yahoo.